Hello, everyone. I'm Alan Pringle, Director of Operations here at Scriptorium Publishing. Welcome to our webcast by Bill Swallow, The Bottom Line, Globalization and the Dependence on Intelligent Content. Before I turn things over to Bill, just want to run through a quick few housekeeping items. Everyone during this webcast will be muted except the presenters. Um, if you have any questions, and we do encourage them, please ask them in the questions area in the webcast interface. If you would, take a few moments to look for that questions panel, uh, and you can type your answers in there. We are recording this presentation, but your name and information will not appear in the recording. Also, uh, due to some prior technical difficulties, I will be driving the slide deck, so apologies in advance uh, if you hear Bill tell me to forward to the next slide. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill. Hi, Bill. Hey. Thanks, Alan, and hi, everybody. Um, as Alan mentioned, I'm a technical consultant with Scriptorium, and my focus is on global technical communications practices also on process improvement and localization practices. Uh, previous in my career, I've worked for two different LSPs, and I've seen many large localization projects through to completion. Um, in, I've been blogging about a lot of my experiences um, on the Scriptorium blog, uh, so you can check those out. There's a few up there already, and I'm sure there'll be plenty more to come. Uh, but today, I'm going to focus more on how you can make a positive impact on your company's bottom line. So let's start with where you are. So you are here, well, not here with me, otherwise I would have baked a cake. But um, you're currently likely working with multiple types of content, uh, producing multiple different outputs for multiple different audiences. You're refining your processes, your workflows, and you're either working with or working toward uh, semantically rich content, structured content, and reusable content. Next slide. But your audience could be anywhere, uh, whether it's intended or not. Uh, a lot of content today is consumed globally. And while there's a localization need for hitting many different regional markets, there's also a translation need for local markets as well. Um, and are we accurately accessing, or assessing those requirements up front and delivering what's truly needed? Now, we spend a lot of time on audience analysis, on messaging and marketing position, but are we doing this locally or are we focusing this globally? Next slide. So let's take a look at a basic project and back up to about a 10,000 foot view. And there are three basic steps to a project. Um, you have a concept that you are working on refining. Uh, you go ahead and implement it to make it a reality. And then finally, you deliver your project. Next. And usually this is where translation fits in, somewhere in between the implementation and the delivery phase. Um, once all the source content is finalized, um, it's sent off to a, a translator and then comes back just in time to deliver to that market. Um, but a lot can happen in that tiny little space. Uh, for in that space, there be monsters. So in the last minute, a lot can go wrong. Uh, your implementation phase can slip, uh, which can uh, jeopardize your entire delivery deadline. Um, this can lead to a rushed effort in translation and also in getting all of the finalized deliverables in place, uh, which never results in our best work. Uh, translation can take longer than planned in this phase, um, whether the translator is available or not, depending on other conflicts that they may have uh, experienced with other projects that were backed up to the last minute. Uh, they may have difficulty with your files when you send them over for translation. Um, they may have difficulty with the subject matter, uh, in which case maybe they don't have a full glossary to go from, uh, so they don't exactly know what you mean when you are using certain terms. Or they may have simply just underestimated the scope of work to complete what you need done. Uh, translation quality um, can be compromised in this phase as well. Uh, because they're rushing at that point, uh, and it can shift the entire scope of the project. Or worse, 
you can hit a dead end. The translator may find a problem with something in your content, um, something that they may need to go back and forth with you about in order to reconcile, uh, to make sure that they're getting the right information translated in the appropriate way. Or worse, um, the content can be completely not appropriate for a particular target audience, forcing you to go back to the drawing board at that late stage of the game for a full redesign. Uh, the culture issues uh, or no equivalent terminology uh, for what you're trying to get across to the audience. Uh, the entire concept of, of what you're talking about may not translate in their particular culture. Um, these are not the surprises that you need right before delivery. Next. So going back to the basic project steps, uh, in this case what we end up seeing is a phase rollout where translation still happens in between the implementation, uh, right after the implementation phase. Uh, but then you have a source delivery um, of, your sor of your source information. You're delivering that out to certain customers while other customers are waiting for you to finally get the translated material in, proofread, approved, and out the door. It's okay for from a project management point of view because then we can break it out into a bit of a waterfall type of approach with regard to releasing uh, various language deliverables. But it's not a situation for your customers, and it's certainly not great for your corporate projections. Next. <clears throat> so in this model, we end up chasing after our savings and not necessarily seeing them up front. Um, we look at our savings from uh, translation memory. So we try to leverage as much reuse as possible so that we're translating fewer unique phrases and terms. Um, we're looking at, uh, from release to release, we're looking at necessarily not editing what's been written before unless it's absolutely necessary, which may or may not be a good thing. You know, something may have been poorly worded before, but if you make the edit, then you have to go back and pay for it to be retranslated. And you try to hope for as much of a 100% match against your translation memory as possible. This way, you can alleviate your cost by having that match. Or you can negotiate with your localization service provider. Uh, usually this involves uh, conversations around price per word. So at that point, you're arguing pennies per word, uh, trying to get the cost down overall. Or in which case, if you decide to leave one localization service provider for another, then you have this kind of balancing act of whether or not the quality is going to be there that you had before, or if it's going to be better, and if their cost versus quality matches what you were getting before or exceeds it. Uh, in, in the worst case scenario, and what usually happens more times than not, is that only a subset of content would then be translated. Um, an executive decision is made to keep costs down and to keep the time frames tight that not all your content goes out for translation. A lot of it will stay, stay only in the source content, or in the source format, in the source language. And bits and pieces of what's deemed um, important will then go out for translation. And in that case, you know, why not translate everything? Um, why, is, why are some things needed? Why are some things not? What's important? What's not? Now, if it's not needed and it's not important, why does the content exist at all? You should be providing, ideally, a full suite of information to all of your markets. Next. So from this point of view, things seem a little bit out of reach. Um, translation at the end, it really limits your overall quality, and it limits the impact on the markets you're trying to reach. Uh, it can result in additional costs, whether it be time, um, whether it be additional localization, um, you know, translation costs themselves. And generally, even though you can see where you want to go, you really just can't get there by the means that you're employing in this model. Uh, despite your best efforts, you're still spending money on translation. You're still um, going through re rework cycles at the last possible minute, and you risk the chance of losing valuable opportunities. Uh, we've heard from clients who've lost major deals, mainly because they didn't have content for a particular market, but their competitor did. Um, whether or not the product uh, or the service that they were, that this particular market was buying, 
was better or not with this other competitor is unknown, but um, chances are I'm, we would never know uh, if the market if the uh, opportunity is lost. Um, we uncovered is that um, a client needed Russian uh, and it was actually for United States workers based in Kentucky. Um, so these little surprises can pop up uh, where you hadn't really seen them, uh, noticed them before uh, if you haven't done your homework up front. Uh, sometimes the translation needs are straightforward, but sometimes they do take a lot of work to figure out exactly what you need, uh, who needs it, and in what format, and whether or not it will be culture, culturally appropriate for them. Next slide. So let's revisit the goals a bit. Uh, what's the goal of your content, and does it align with your company goals? Uh, when we talk about bottom line, uh, a lot of times in business we talk about net profits, uh, which, is, which are very important, um, but it also points to the company goals. You know, what exactly are they? Uh, are they quality? Uh, is it to have the happiest of customers? Uh, is it to be the dominant player in your particular market? Uh, is it looking toward uh, industry recognition? And, um, being identified as the uh, the best in your field, uh, or does it just come down to profit? Usually, it may be any combination of these factors. Next slide. So, looking at a better model uh, would be to go ahead and address your global needs up front during the conceptual phase. It brings all of your requirements to light. It identifies all of your markets and all of their needs and all of your audiences and what languages they speak, what cultures they come from, and what will be appropriate for them. And you can use this insight uh, to then build your strategy uh, and create a plan uh, that takes you from creation to delivery. And intelli employing intelligent content can get us there. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about content appropriateness. Um, this is really the key when approaching global markets. Uh, Sarah O'Keefe has been uh, presenting some information and posting some information online about a hierarchy of content needs uh, based off of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, you can see information about this on our blog and on SlideShare. But before useful content can be either be intelligent or connected, it has to be appropriate. It has to be in the right language, it has to be in the right format, and it has to be at the right level of complexity for the audience. It has to meet all of the audience's needs and expectations, which means that audience analysis is absolutely critical. And it has to be done at the global level. We can't assume anything based on the analysis that we do uh, with any one particular group, because it may not apply to another. And we can't necessarily leave a lot of these decisions for the translators to get right. It's your content. It's your messages. So we need to make sure that when we're going about it, that it, everything that we develop is culturally appropriate, is legally appropriate, and is contextually accurate. Next slide. So to use a small example here, a basic example, um, we'll talk about the phrase home run. And while it's widely understood in North America uh, as kind of a, a big win or a success, um, it may be understood, but the meaning or the use of it may vary in other countries. And even more so, it may not be w well understood at all in some other countries. So in this case, we would have to make a note of the meaning and the intent of the term. Uh, what is it that we're trying to say? Well, we're trying to say that something was wildly successful. Um, and then we need to work with local resources to say, this is the point we want to get across. What is the best um, phrase to use in this particular market for this particular group of people? And then we develop uh, an equivalent approach to deliver that to them. Next slide. So going back to the conceptual phase, um, we should really start figuring out all of our content needs up front. Um, and then how do our audience needs really line up 
uh, around that and how do their needs define uh, what types of content we need to produce. And from that we can start um, kind of bucketing thing, uh, bucketing types of content into three different types, um, which I've basically labeled unique, adaptable, and global. So a unique content type is something that is absolutely custom tailored for a very specific audience. Uh, adaptable content is mostly uniform, but there is some customized treatment of the content therein, um, whether it's conditional or, um, or what have you. And then there's global content, which really has no special treatment applied to it. It's really something that can be consumed by any audience and understood. Um, so when we're approaching the conceptual phase, we should be handling the unique needs up front. Uh, these unique needs uh, will inform how we approach the rest of our content. It helps us develop uh, things like a semantic taxonomy for our content uh, and for applying metadata to the content. And it will show you where gaps and issues will arise during your content development phases. And really this all gives you the tools that you need to tackle uh, big issues before they actually become even bigger problems. Next slide. So we'll talk a little bit about um, the amount of content that's usually produced. And this is usually as a percentage. Um, and you'll see that unique content really makes up a small percentage of the overall amount of content that uh, will generally be produced. Uh, usually this is in the form of targeted marketing. Uh, where you're trying to get a specific message to a very specific audience that affects them in a very specific way. Uh, adaptable content is a little bit larger, but it's still fairly manageable. Um, this takes the form of instructions uh, or of highly contextual information. Um, so when talking about specific hardware or infrastructure or anything that involves human interaction, there may be nuances that need to be addressed uh, depending on um, their location, what their infrastructure is, and so forth. And adaptable content usually is the more engaging forms of content that you have. The global content uh, really is the largest chunk that you'll be developing, and it's in, it takes the form of all the highly technical content that goes out there. Um, information that generally does not need to uh, does not need to uh, impact or, or doesn't need to speak to someone in a very specific way. It's the content is what it is, um, and it's describing something uh, very, very basically and very bluntly. Next slide. Now, the degree of develop the degree of difficulty around developing the content uh, really takes on a different picture. So, while the unique content uh, built a, a very small amount of your, your total amount of content that you're developing, it requires probably the most uh, amount of effort and um, awareness when developing this, this content. It's usually completely custom for a particular audience. And your adaptable content is right behind it, uh, where even though you may have a lot of content that can be reused and can be uh, used by a global audience, there is some special treatment that needs to be applied to the content in order to make sure that it's appropriate. And the global content, really, there's a lot of effort that goes into producing it, but on the difficulty stage, it's really minimal uh, with regard to the amount of difficulty to produce it because it really is what it is. There's no special treatment that needs to be applied in order to make it appropriate for a particular audience. Next slide. So in looking at content types, we usually see that technical communication leans toward the global, uh, the global side of content, where marketing communications uh, more leans toward the unique. Uh, technical communication is usually very detailed, uh, very factual. Um, it's usually very consistent and structured. Uh, it's highly reusable uh, because there is no special treatment around um, around the content itself. And 
what we're seeing more times than not is that the language is really starting to be controlled within uh, within the technical communication that's being produced. Uh, where on the on the Marcom side, the content's very persuasive. It's very emotional, uh, very creative and playful, and it's extremely targeted uh, to make sure that it has the maximum impact on those receiving it. Uh, but this is a great opportunity uh, for technical communication and and marketing communications to really start working together uh, because all of these unique needs that are defined in the unique content sets, um, they, can, uh, they can influence and, uh, and assist uh, on the technical communication side uh, because it can provide the foundation for building the necessary metadata around the content to be able to leverage it as needed. Um, Likewise, on the tech comm side, there are a lot of structured practices that are in place that marketing can really benefit from to kind of ease their development over time. Next slide. So when it comes to translation, uh, global content really is a machine translation candidate. Um, you may or may not decide to go this route, and there are plus, uh, pluses and minuses for doing so. Um, but it's it's pretty much the only type of content that really allows itself to be machine translated. Whereas on the unique content side, we're really looking at transcreation, which is taking a particular concept and really recreating it in a new locale, in a new cultural surrounding, uh, and making sure that the messaging is unique and custom tailored to that particular audience. Um, and there's always a bit of special treatment in the middle um, when looking at uh, a lot of the adaptable content. Uh, so you may have custom terminology depending on where the content is going and who's, re who's reading it. Um, and it can be conditional by context or appropriateness based on that audience. Um, and there's a cultural align alignment that needs to happen in this space. So your use of different phrases and so forth, going back to the, the example of home run, um, you'll have these different treatments of different phrases and there'll be ways of managing that information uh, to make sure that it's appropriate for each audience. Next slide. So the bottom line, is that translation really isn't something that you tack on at the end. Um, and we need to plan for all of our targets. Um, we need to factor in all of our outputs, all of our languages, audiences, locales, cultures, and make sure that we're hitting them all appropriately. And we have to keep the delivery target in sight. But by doing so, we're able to inform at the beginning of the project exactly what needs to happen through all the different phases, whether it be technologically or whether it be uh, process related, what needs to happen to the content and those producing it to be able to produce the deliverables and get them out the door on time. So, at this point, if there are any questions based on what I've talked about or if there are any specific questions with regard to things that you're encountering during your localization efforts. So if you have questions, go ahead and type them into the questions panel. I've got one or two here that I've seen. Um, so basically you're telling us we should be working with marketing up front? Yes, as much as possible, really. I mean, the line is really blurring between marketing and, and technical communication, where we're seeing a lot of needs uh, for custom-tailored technical documentation, and we're seeing a lot of need for pushing out a lot of targeted information on the marketing side that really could benefit from um, a more structured approach on the back end. So, yes, I mean, the more that marketing and technical communication work together, I, it's, it makes for a much better overall process flow over time uh, because there are diff there's different information being assembled and assessed and used by each group 
when it comes to either developing content or tailoring messaging toward a particular audience. You mentioned the term home run is something that doesn't translate well or go to other locales well. Why not just not use it at all? Uh, it really depends. I mean, that's a very basic example, but there are certain phrases and so forth that may catch, uh, catch the eye uh, or really speak to a particular audience. And in some cases, I mean, it might not be again, in the global content set uh, that um, it may be used. But in order to make a point or really send a message uh, to an audience, you may want to use um, some type of idiom or whatnot in order to appeal to that audience. I know that in the past, it's been frowned upon to use uh, idioms, colloquialisms, and, and whatnot in content. But as we try to make content more engaging, uh, they ultimately start creeping back. So the best practice around that is to get the idea formulated as to what it is that you really want to get across to your audience as a whole, and then find out what the different cultural implications are about making that statement and working with experts um, in those cultural areas to fine-tune the wording uh, choices to make sure that they're going to be appropriate for that particular audience. Yeah, and I think even going back to the question of appropriateness, what may be good in marketing material may not work for TechCom. Home Run may be much better you know, suited for marketing information, for example, than, say, uh, steps in a, in a procedure in TechCom. So there is like this context issue as part of the appropriateness from my point of view. Yeah, there is there is a context and there is um, there is a divide there. But again, you have that uh, that blue area um, of the um, you know kind of that middle ground content uh, that right. you really need to be you know aware of. You know that adaptable content where you know you have maybe 90% of it is something that you can leverage, but if you just want to have that extra punch to make sure that you're getting across to your audience, you may want to go ahead and start using um, some form of, of targeted messaging and just making sure that you're not just writing it once, writing home run down and sending it out the door to your translators and let them worry about it, that you want to actually make sure that you know, you get the concept of what it is you're trying to say across to people who will help you uh, tailor that message for the specific audiences before it goes to translation, or at least yeah, give the translator the guideline. Yeah, we have a comment from one of the attendees. Our company is seeing resistance to using the American marketing messages translated for other companies. There is a strong push for local creation of content. I've seen that as well, um, and many times the um, the reason for that is that you know the local development of content ensures that it's appropriate for that particular audience. Um, now, there's a cost to doing uh, work in that fashion, where you essentially have many different groups of people developing or retooling a, a particular content set. So, at some point. You're going to be. You're going to really lose the leverage uh, from one to the other. So if if there's an update that needs to be made, and one particular group implements it first, it becomes very difficult for other groups to then just easily grab that and use it. Um, so trying to keep things centralized and being able to be aware of the various cultural needs and being able to build that. Um, into either you know conditional sets or into a taxonomy um, so that you can easily manage the varying context via metadata. Um, it really becomes critical for cost savings and also for time to production. One other question. Um, how do you get audience analysis to cover all audiences? Oh, that's another very good question. Um, you have to drive it, unfortunately. Um, now, if you ha if you work for a company that's producing content for 
let's say, four different markets, um, you can pretty much cover your particular market that you're you know, residing within. But your company ideally should have people on the ground in those other markets, so to speak. Um, and they should, you know, one of their jobs really should be to be analyzing that market and being able to define these needs, uh, being able to clearly communicate back um, what exactly, you know, the audience is going to need and how they're going to need it. Let's see, we have any other questions? Anybody else? I believe that's it for the question. Okay. <clears throat> so as final notes, um, this recording will be up on the blog in, within a few days, and you can always check our events page for any upcoming events. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Yes, thank you, everyone.